All right, guys. So thanks for listening to the Mastering B2B Marketing Podcast. Today, I bring on the show, Sam. And Sam, we were talking about how to pronounce your last name. It's Keenly, Sam Keenly. Uh, for those that are wondering how to pronounce his last name, he is yeah. the VP of Demand Generation at Refine Labs. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Glad we got the uh, last name confusion out of the way. <laughs> I know. I definitely didn't want to chop it up either. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> yeah. So maybe let's start off um, how you chose a career in marketing. That's always a really good question. Yeah. Because uh, on the note of family, it, it kind of runs along that thread. So in our family, we've had an advertising agency for three generations. So I grew wow. up around print, radio, TV. That was always just conversations going on, dad nice. going and running that kind of stuff. My mom was a, a journalism major. So I've always just been around that side of, of the world more or less. So I think just a lot of it came naturally through picking it up in conversation and then went to school. Um, selfishly, not selfishly, I wasn't ready to give up soccer. So I went to a small D3 school to play soccer and I went there and the school was an incredible, incredible school for pre-med and engineering. I was not smart enough for pre-med or engineering there. So I was like, it's do business. I love business. So um, went in the marketing route there and then, and, uh, that's a track that I took. And then when I went into the working world, I was just, you know, went to a big company. I wanted to move down South. So I came to Charleston, took a job at the first company that offered the role as basically an SDR. So came up as an SDR. I am a driven individual. So I hit quota, but I did not like having a new quota every month, every quarter. So I was like, of That's course. Not really the, route. <laughs> the marketing route. So it kind of came back full circle to growing up around marketing and advertising and everything. And then um, from there, it really just moved up the, the marketing side. So I learned in marketing ops background was kind of how I got my, my initial start and then moved slowly into digital marketing from there as I was working at this publicly traded company. And there was one person running all of digital marketing for an international company close to a billion dollars in revenue. I was like, I think there's an opportunity there to, uh, to join that team. So that was the, the launching point. And then from there, it's, it's been history, just, you know, basically learning marketing as we all go. And since it's something that's always evolving and changing, that's what's most exciting about it. Totally. I love that you kind of grew up already uh, with your family already being in the marketing and, you know, advertising industry already. So there's a lot of things that you just pick up at an early age. Exactly. Yeah. And so I felt, I felt kind of bad because my dad goes, so do you want to take on the family agency? And I'm like, Northwest Ohio running print TV and radio and billboards. Ah, I think it's time to, uh, to let that one go. It's always hard for them. That's their dream, right? <laughs> yeah. So they like, were, still love you, dad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They're, I, I think they, they appreciate it now because they have a vacation spot to come to when they want to come to Charleston. There you go. There you go. So how did you end up, you know, falling upon um, or stumbling upon uh, refine labs. I think the same way that just about everyone does, Chris. Yeah. Uh, came across know, something. One of his po he posts every day on LinkedIn. Came across something on LinkedIn. Um, engaged with him in in comments, and it was at the time where their company was expanding. I was at the point in my career where I was starting to recognize this marketing concept I couldn't quite grasp. Mm -hmm. And it was what we now call demand gen, where I was just running all these eBooks and this lead gen hamster wheel that I couldn't quite figure out why isn't this turning into deals for our company? You know, mm -hmm. I'm hitting my goals. This should be flowing through the funnel. It's not flowing through the funnel as, as expected. So yeah, I spoke to Chris and he was just kind of that person who was just like, he could finally put words to what was just sloshing around in my head that I couldn't quite pick on. I was like, I get it. So uh -huh. He and I chat opportunities opened up and then, yeah, from there it's been, it's been history and really like, you know, being able to have a company that embraces this philosophy of how buying actually happens today, where, you know, once you get out of the trade shows, you have to get our white sheet or talk to, you know, yeah. John in order to get your demo and the world's just changed so much. So yeah, just Absolutely. that atmosphere is really what drove me over here. Now, were you doing demand generation before Refine Labs? Yeah. So the way that we were structured at the, at the large company was... I headed up the like the digital marketing execution team. So we were running the Google, the display ads, the like anything that was online presence had to flow through my team. So there were 40 different products, 10 different verticals served. So they all had a demand gen manager. And then I would work with them as like the execution arm to make that happen. Got you. Got you. So now, well, before you were director 
of demand generation at Refine Labs now, your VP of you know demand generation at Refine Labs. Um, one, what did you do, and how do you? What's the difference between the two? Yeah. So what I did, honestly, it was young, growing company. It was part of when I joined, there were less than ten of us, and then as you scale only so many people can report to Megan, who was our COO, but, you know, as as we grow, it's not realistic for her to manage, you know, 20 directors. (laughs) So we have to add in layers of people who understand the role of the director, what's needed in order to support that that individual. So we started promoting internally individuals who were in director and who also wanted to go that people management route instead of, we have two different routes. You can kind of go people management or you can go individual contributor, become that true master of, you know, Mm. demand strategy and everything. So, uh, the way that I'd spoken with her about my career is I, I definitely was drawn more towards a people management route. So when the time came for the team to need to continue to grow, uh, Judy Sheriff was our first, she, I call her the, the OG VP for Demand Gen at Refine Labs. And then, yeah, once once her team filled up, we needed to add another. So um, just through being here for a while, embracing that, that's what what led to me taking on that role. So the difference between the two, I guess I'll ask you for clarification. Yeah. You're asking for the difference between the two at Refine Labs or just like when we talk about the role in general? Just talking about the role in general, I'm sure your, you know, your duties change uh, from director to VP. Maybe they don't, maybe just, just pay and that's it, you know? I yeah. Know. No, they, um, they're definitely different. This is something that um, I was, I touched on with uh, Casey Graham over at, at Grave. We were talking about this because we're trying to add directors, our team. He was looking to add a VP to his team. Mm-hmm. And the easiest way to, describe it, I would say is, you know, I I come up from a sports background, so I use way too many sports analogies and metaphors, but I say that a VP is kind of like the European football soccer coach. So he Mm -hmm. brings in the best talent that he can, he or she brings in the best talent that that they can. And then they coach them during the week. They give them the tools that they need to be successful. And then on game day, they let them go and do their thing. They give them the strategy. They tell them how you need to execute. And then they give it to the team to figure out what's the best way to execute in that given time. Right. So the VP is really, it's like the vision, how are we doing it? And then I'm going to put you on positions. This is key. You figure out what you need to do in your role in order to make that happen. The director is, it's kind of like the, the quarterback, so to speak, if we flop over to American football at that point where he knows the overall game plan and strategy, mm-hmm. but you know, when it comes time to run the play, he's got three different options to throw to, or he could hand it off. So he's figuring out, you know, what's the specific tactics that we need to do in order to make this happen and then giving it to that person to make it do. So, you know, wide receiver could be like, you know, paid search or a podcast or, you know, coming up with the different variables to, to give it to in order to figure out like, how do we accomplish the the goals we want to set out to with the strategy? No, that's good. Um, the other thing that I've been seeing on changing topics a little bit is on LinkedIn, uh, a lot of B2B marketers are posting about, you know, you need a business narrative that drives content marketing. You need a solid strategy. You need good tactics, but it's the same content over and over. It gets boring (laughs) and stale. I'm really curious to know because nobody's really talking about and I don't know if it's out of fear, but nobody's really talking about what are the deep customer insights that you're seeing instead of telling people, talk to your customer, here's the end, you need the insights. What are the insights? We don't know what the insights are. Yeah. So can you provide what customer insights and how analytics combine? And instead of just, here's the data, like what are the aha moments that you see yeah. when you see the customer insights and analytics? You will be the first one who talks about this, by the way. <laughs> Hey, we'll take it. Yeah. That's always, I, I'm very much like you. It's like, I'm like, cool. That's the concept. How, how do I do it? Tell me how, what do I do? So yeah, that's something where yeah we definitely get into with all of our, our clients and their customers as well. So when I think about uh, deep insights, it's going to vary just by, you know, their product, their industry, so many different sure. factors. It can be things such as um, a common one that, that we see, especially with startups, is there's a price mismatch relative to the product feature value. So you think that your market is, you know, small and growing companies, but you price it like you're targeting mid-market or enterprise. And so that's where you might have a mismatch between mm-hmm. the product value is, isn't, doesn't justify the higher spend. So you either have to drop the spend to match the product value, or you have to 
improve your, your product feature so it can compete with those more established other solution competitors that, that you might be going against. So that's a big one where, where sometimes we'll have a tough conversation with a client who they think that their product justifies that price point when right. the market will tell you you don't. And that's just a simple talk to your customers or run a report in Salesforce and see how many deals once I get to opportunity create or SQO. If you don't have a DQ reason for losses like cost or budget, things like that, go put that in and then you'll find out if if there's a substantial amount falling in there, that's an indicator that there's a mismatch between what your your market thinks it should be paying and what you're charging. So go ahead. That, that involves talking to customers too. Yeah, yeah, it's both of them. So- um, And market yeah, research. About that. Um, and then other simple things are just like, my favorite, what does your prospects or your market, what type of content do they prefer? So I'll go and ask them just like, me personally, I'm, I love video, but I'm not going to watch it with sound. So I'll tell people like, you know, just make sure you CC your stuff. Or I'm not one to read a, a PDF that's 14 pages long. Give me the TLDR version and a 30 second loom video or something else. Mm. So that's going to vary though so much by if you're, if your market is very technical or right. if they are on the go, or if they are like nurses who are just scrolling Facebook. So that's where we say you have to ask them what they like. Don't make the assumption of how you like to consume is how your market's going to. So I've got a handful of these. Let me know if you want me to stop or if I'll keep like, going because nobody talks about this stuff on LinkedIn. I'm telling you, yeah. everyone talks about the concepts, but no one gets to the needy greedy, here's the tactics that we actually do. Here's what we see. Um, and here's the deep insights that no one really talks about. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, content mediums, content topics. So is it, you know, do you want to hear how you should be doing your job better? Do you want to hear a case study? I mean, there's one of the guys on our team of Bedcon just came up with a list of 50 other ways to make content. And it's like, everyone's done the white yeah. paper, the ebook. So I, I'll have to share that link with you after this for people to go and look, but he's got like a word puzzle and stuff in there, which is actually pretty funny. Nice. Um, so things like that. And then, yeah, where are they consuming the content? So I'm sure right now you're hearing all about like TikTok, show me me on TikTok. Like I'm on TikTok, my wife's on TikTok, my neighbor's on TikTok, like everyone's on it. Right. So not saying that you need to be on there right now, but you need to go where people are spending time. Some, play, some people are more on TikTok. Others are still on Twitter very much. So a lot of thought leaders and influencers spend time on there. So you need to not just follow the crowd and assume that because that's where market's heading, you need to ask your people and, and see like Clubhouse. Last year was a mm. perfect example. It's like, oh we need gosh. to be on Clubhouse. So yeah, RIP yeah. to that one. <laughs> um, but so many people doubled down on that right immediately. And I was just thinking, you know, let it validate itself before. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to wait a year, but just give it a couple months and see what kind of traction or if your customers and market are saying, yeah, I love Clubhouse. I wish you all would put more content on it. Or mm. those are the things where just discovery calls, you can pick up the phone and ask them just see, you know, where, where are you spending your free time? And then let's go to, go to that. So the consumer, sorry, real quick, the consumer mm -hmm. insights and the analytics that you're seeing, the most common one is the pricing, not matching with the, what the market is asking. But it's earlier stage companies. That's more common is you really are looking for that validation later mm -hmm. stage. You're not going to get a series C series D if you don't have that already pretty well locked in, but there's always wiggle room for it and, and things to continue to fine tune, especially if you're product led or something that's going to like a new competitor enters the market that can shake things up really quickly. Hmm. And then that also shapes the strategy and the tactics. Yeah. Cause it's going to influence. Okay. Well, if we need to be focused on customer acquisition, what are we willing to spend for it? If they're staying with us for six months, we need to recoup that money before it. Or if it's a three-year deal, we have a, a longer runway in order to, to accomplish that. So yeah, there's a lot of different things that can come into for play. For sure. I was just wondering what would it's top of mind yeah. kind of like, okay, this always seems to be the one that we always find. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rabbit hole it. Not enough people also um, factor in the like, the lifetime value effect of not only having someone that stays longer, but then they will amplify your brand and your product if they enjoy it. So that's also mm -hmm. going to drop acquisition costs. If you know, you get Jenny over here who really loves your services or your product. She, people like to validate that they've made a good decision. So mm -hmm. she'll want to go in and recommend it to her, her colleague or someone else at another company is using it and then have a good customer experience. And that's just going to make everything way easier in the long run. How do you guys get customers to promote the services that they're in love with your guys' services already. It's deliver value. I mean, the number you guys of times don't send that, an email or call them or 
you, you know, can, I, but I mean, think about the things that, that you share or whatever. It's usually it's someone shares something really cool on LinkedIn. You take a screenshot of it, you send it to your buddy or, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, what was it? There was a company that I get um, a health supplement from and they wrote me a handwritten note saying like, thank you for, for buying this from us. You know, we're really appreciative. Who does that anymore? Like it doesn't take a touch. lot, but yeah. I will tell everyone anytime, like, that, you want to talk about a commodity market where you can pick from hundreds or thousands of, of options. All right. I'll buy from them for the rest of my life. And I'm going to recommend my family or anyone else if they ask, yeah, go back from this company. So yeah, just add value, be a human, treat people like, you know, don't overthink it and treat people like numbers or data points. Treat them as if like it was you in their shoes. Boom. And when I was thinking about, you know, putting myself uh, in the customer's shoes, the ones that I actually talk about the most with my peers is the ones that actually have built a personal genuine relationship with me and they don't just see me as a transaction. They see me on a relational level. So that's another good LinkedIn post idea for you, Sam. Yeah. (laughs) If you want to steal it, yeah. how to be relational, not transactional. Boom. There you go. (laughs) No, I I will let you take that one. Then I will translate. Yeah. Relationship. It's a, it's a very real thing where like even us, we're, we compete with a lot of different marketing agencies and stuff. And the first thing I would tell my team is, you know, go deep on creating relationships with people because anyone can execute paid search or Facebook ads. That's not like they're buying our strategy, but the relationship that you provide is such a stronger latch to keeping people happy with our services than totally good month of Google. That's the one thing that I also want to, I don't know, emphasize on what you're saying. A lot of agencies can provide service even quality service, but customer service sucks. Yeah. And that is what people would rather pay for to be real with you. Yeah. I've had customers that I'm like their therapist (laughs) and I'm like, we, cause we provide, you know, B2B web development services and we'll talk and I'm like, that has nothing to do with websites. Yeah. This has nothing to do with websites. Because of that. They've been loyal for five plus years. And I'm just like, wow. Like what you're saying is huge and undervalued. And it's, it's just crazy. Cause you would assume people would jump on this. No, there's, there's so no think, more tech behind it. You can't I, sell it. So no one's pushing you that. You can't message. sell it, but also people aren't taught to be relationship builders. So that's another uh, deep insight there into learning. Yeah. Now I want to dive into one of your favorite topics, lead gen versus demand gen. So I'm a B2B marketer turned CEO. I came from, I've seen companies that do Legion um, pisses off the sales team yeah, because it's a waste of their time. And to the point where the sales team just doesn't even follow up with them anymore when they get a lead. They're like, I'm focused on my regional territory. I don't, don't bombard me with this. But then over a course of five, 10 years, they're making like 5 million or plus from this lead generation company. So they'll keep feeding two, three K sometimes 5K a month just to put their credit card on file and say, hey, we'll pay $23, $25 per lead that comes in. You call some of these because I've worked you know, very closely with these uh, salespeople, especially inside salespeople. And they're like, hey, I never filled out a form. Why are you calling me? <laughs> you get a lot of that kind of stuff. I, I know you're rolling your eyes. So my thing is, How do you change the mindset, or maybe you don't convince them because they should educate themselves on this, but what kind of, why do people still do lead gen? I don't really get it. I get it makes money, but at this, it's not like sustainable and your sales team hates it. No, it's still predictable revenue model. It's, you know, we can make a model, we can build a funnel. We know that we make X calls, it's going to lead to X leads, which is going to lead to X opportunities. And, you know, they just run it through that, which was an incredible strategy 10, 20 years ago when people still picked up your phone. Like if you're not in my phone book, if I don't have your number saved, I'm screening, I'm not answering the phone. 10 right. years ago, you pick up everything. Someone calls your house phone. Hey, what's up? Like, you know, it's, it's a completely different <laughs> world. And so nothing has, has adapted with that. And so the reason people are still doing it is because they just, We've always done it this way. It's going to work. They don't realize that it's getting harder and harder and harder every year where it used to be, you know, 10 dials would make make one meeting. Now it's a hundred dials makes one meeting. So let's just get more BDRs. Let's keep trying to pump this engine. That's not efficient by any means. So the, the best way to get people to switch is a, um, 
show them, mm -hmm. split your funnel to show them the impact of when we go specifically on this channel, it's going to take a thousand calls just to get this. Or if we put the money of 10 BDRs into paid media or partnership or, you know, whatever else you want to do and start comparing those flows. Cause what happens all too often is execs blend their funnel into one thing. And then they just assume that everything's going to convert at that blended rate, which is very far from the truth. You go and look at the people who say, I want to talk to your sales team. When they go to your, get a demo form on your website, mm -hmm. those people, that form is going to convert to an opportunity 30 to 40%. Right. Compare that to that lead gen form where someone just wants the ebook, that's going to convert to an opportunity at less than 1%. They treat them as the same. That's the underlying issue. So you have to show them the data of how those are different and how, how much I'd say like cost per acquisition it's going to cost them because they get so caught up in the, in the big number up top where we get so many leads from it though. And it's super cheap. It's like, well, yes, you do, but nothing's converting. So when we start to look at cost per opportunity or cost per customer acquisition, that's a completely mm. different story. And that's where it's not sustainable. So, yeah. So let's say a company, a B2B company is, you know, over a course of, five years, seven years, I don't know. I'm just throwing random numbers up. They're getting five, 10 mil from this lead generation company, right? And then say that they're open to trying demand generation. Would they be doing, would you recommend them doing a blend or eventually doing a blend and then cutting the lead gen off? I mean, it totally depends on, yeah, a lot of other stuff. So that's a, that's a loaded question right there. Yeah. Marketing, <laughs> stereotypical marketing answer. It depends. Um, there, we see different instances. It totally depends on how good or bad, because for, for some companies, I will very rarely make never or always statements because for some companies, the lead gen does work. Right. It's not super efficient, but it's a lot better than it, than we usually see. So in those instances, we say, let's taper, you know, let's, let's run this while it's still working, but start to build this long-term engine that's going to be more sustainable for you. And then we'll figure out the right fix between the two. Other people, it's just, you know, it's beating a dead horse where you're, generating all these leads and nothing's working. So we're saying you're just straight up inefficient at this point. We need to reallocate. So those are always the fun conversations on when the execs yeah. come to you freaking out about where'd all our leads go? What are our BDRs going to do? It's like, well, your pipeline's still the same if you haven't noticed because we've just scraped all this garbage off the top that was never turning into pipeline anyway. So now we're going to reallocate that in a way that's going to be better for you because it's going to turn into more pipeline. So Totally. The big thing there is, yeah, just don't focus on that big number up top. Look at like, you know, the dollar signs are what keeps your business open, the pipeline, the revenue, focus on mm -hmm. that. And that should be, remain roughly flat. If your lead gen is truly inefficient, that's because it's not impacting your pipeline. I'm curious because uh, the CEOs that have this lead generation, paying a lead generation company, they really don't get marketing. And I don't mean it in a very critical way. Like mm -hmm. they truly don't understand it and sometimes don't even value it. They value sales. They're, you know, they're more of a sales machine mm -hmm. um, than the marketing department. Do you guys also encounter that? Um, and yes, this is more of a blanket statement <laughs> because I, I, I'm curious to know, like, do you guys really get see, have CEOs that are doing lead gen, but are like value marketing and get it and are open to the idea for demand generation? I'm just super curious. Yeah, we've had it before. It's not, I mean, it's not crazy uncommon and it's no knock on the CEOs. It's they yeah. know what they know. They don't know what they don't know. The difference between the two is their CEOs who say, we're going to brute force our way through this because I dictate everything in our company strategy. And then there's the CEOs who say, look, I'm bringing you on as a marketer because you know marketing. I don't know marketing. Let me know how I can mm. support you, but you dictate the strategy that needs to happen in order for us to accomplish that. Mm. And it all relates to the overarching, like what's our goal aligning on that. So that's why we always say start with revenue, not because you have to figure out how every lead equals revenue, but you can work backwards from revenue and that lead number can change drastically just because of so many variables that impact that as you work your way up or down the funnel. So right. whenever I, I have, a, yeah. So whenever a client comes in and says, we need a hundred leads, I say, why show me what's your goal. And they'll usually say, well, we need hundred leads because it comes from X, Y, Z. I'm like, well, what's the revenue goal that started with? And let's start with that. Cause there's a lot of assumptions built into there that got you to hundred. Yeah. That I bet we can find efficiencies or other ways of doing things that will be better for you long-term. Now, the two types of CEOs that you mentioned is one is prideful, one is humble, willing to learn, grow. Um, you guys are the experts. You guys teach me, right? So if you get the one that's prideful, arrogant, conceited, all this stuff, I'm going to push my agenda, whatever. I don't even know why the heck I hired you, but I'm going to pay you guys. I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. They're not a good fit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you guys take those on? No, we turn right. them away. 
turn them away? We, um, that's one of the biggest things that I, that I love about what we do is we look for philosophical alignment, not just from the decision maker, the VP, the CMO, Good. but down their organization. So their digital marketer, their demand marketers, whoever we might be working with, and also across. So the head of sales, the CFO, the CEO, because this is a long-term investment. It's not a light switch. We're going to turn on your pipeline. It's going to take six months to really start to get this thing going. So hmm. we will, if there's not alignment, we will say like, you know, appreciate the interest, but if you're not bought in, then we're going to be fighting an uphill battle the whole way. And it's not going to pan out. Awesome. Last question that I have for you is, do you have any tips for B2B marketing professionals? Tips for B2B marketing professionals. Um, don't blindly follow all the advice you hear. Like, yes, we all get on LinkedIn and shout from our soap boxes about you should talk to your customers. You should do this. Test it for yourself. You know, there's a use case, there's a nuance, there's everything is so specific. So I would say hear the advice, but test it for yourself before you just go and implement this thing across whatever it is that you're doing. Awesome. Well, Sam, thanks for your time again. Yeah, thank you. This is fun. Yeah, we'll keep in touch. Sounds good. Thanks again.